morning, everyone. How are you? It's good to see your smiling faces, right? You guys excited for church this morning? It's good to be here this morning. I know. God's house. Amen. I hope you've been praying for your pastor this week. Uh, I know I surely have. It's always, you always wonder going into another country what possibly could happen. He did tell me yesterday as I was talking to him on the phone, he actually got stopped in customs because of all the tracks that he took with him. They were wondering what they were for, but they ended up letting him go. You just never know um, possibly what could happen, but thankfully uh, he's back home. We pray that he uh, he gets a speedy recovery. I know his desire is to be here um, with his people. I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i been going through Baptist distinctives in the men's Sunday school class, and I'm going to break away from that this morning uh, to touch on a subject that most of us are experiencing right now, light. Um, this auditorium is filled with light, and the topic today is light, light of the Bible. What, what does light mean? How does it apply to us as Christians? It's very fascinating the subject of light, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I would encourage you to personally do a study on light. It's very, very fascinating, and I'll talk a little bit more about it here in a couple of minutes, but before we start, let's go to God in a word of prayer and ask him to bless the Sunday school hour. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, God, for this time that you've given us. Just uh, come to your place and to worship your holy name. I do ask that you would help us to set aside just the weight and the things that are just burning us down in our lives. We ask that you would help us to gain much from your word this morning. I pray you encourage us, uplift us, edify us, reprove us if we need it, Lord. And I ask that you would be with all the Sunday school classes here this morning. That you'd be with all the teachers. I ask that you would give them liberty. Give them clarity as they teach their students. I pray that you would be with each student, that you would help them to gain much from your word for eternity's sake. I ask that you would be with our pastor this morning, that you would, your hand of healing would be upon him, that the sickness would just simply flee quickly away. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. You've been so faithful, and we praise you for it. And God, I pray that you just... Help me as I teach this lesson, as I take your holy word, I pray you would undertake for me. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 1, we're going to start there on the subject of light. Genesis chapter number 1. We're going to be flipping back and forth, back and forth between the New Testament and Old Testament. But before we start into this lesson, there are some... Fascinating things about light. I'm not sure. Some of you might know these things. Some of you might not know these things. But I have four things here about light. There's many, many, many things about light. Some facts that we know. But here's this four that I went through. I, I thought that were fascinating. The sun is actually white when seen from space. Does anyone know that? The sun is white when seen from space. And this is why. The light is not scattered. The light is scattered by our atmosphere. So when we see the sun, we see it as... Some are, some are thinking about it. Yellow. But in space, it's actually viewed as white because the atmosphere is not breaking it up. And so in our atmosphere, it's actually breaking it up. But from space, it's actually seen as white. That's very interesting. Um, we're going to get... Just keep that in the back of your head. Number two, sunlight can reach a depth of 80 meters in the ocean. It's pretty far. Also, number three, most of us know this from biology. Plants are green because they reflect green light and absorb other colors for photosynthesis. Most of us know that, right? Hopefully you remember biology. I didn't really like biology, but I do remember that. Number four, this is the interesting one. Let me know if anyone actually knows this one. 
the world's longest lasting light bulb, the Centennial Light in California, has reportedly, reportedly been burning since 1901. Did you know that? One person. Anyone else? You heard of that? Two people? I've never heard of that before actually looking it up. That's amazing. That's a long lasting light bulb. That's pretty amazing. I wish I, they would create more like that, right? But that's amazing. Light. Now, if you take notes, I want you to note this. The word light in the Bible is mentioned 244 times completely. Just the word light alone. 244 times. So God has placed an emphasis on light. Now, when you study the Bible, I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to reiterate it here again. When you study the Bible, there's a law, what we like to call the law of first mention. The law of first mention in the Bible usually helps you unlock the truths you find in the Bible itself. Okay? So, speaking on light, we're going to look back in Genesis where it was all created. Genesis chapter number 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided it, divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Go over to verse 14. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. This passage of scripture, we find two places lights mentioned in the creation account on day number one and day number four. Day number one, we find that it's very important that you take note of this, that God never calls darkness good. He only references that to light. So make sure and mentally in your mind, or if you have your personal Bible, underline that in your Bible. Light is called good. Nothing else is as far as day number one is concerned, okay? Light is called good, not darkness. So here we see the first point I want you to get, we're going to see the purpose of light. Now, many of us know a lot of things about light. Light also, what we like to call reveals, right? We're walking down a dark path at night. We want a, a light, a flashlight. In the olden days, it a lantern. So we want a flashlight. Why? What's the point of it? Exactly. Where we can see where you're going. We want to see where we're going. Correct? Correct. And so light will reveal. Also, light does many other things. Light reflects. Light also does anyone else? Yep. Exposes the darkness. Anything else? Heats up. Anyone else have anything? Light divides. Okay? This is the first one we're going to look at. The light divides. Here in Genesis chapter number 1, you will take note of this in verse number 4. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The, what is the purpose of light? It's to divide. It's to divide. Now we see this in verses 14 through 18 as well. Light is created to divide, and light is called good. That word that you see there in Genesis chapter number 1, verse 5, and verse 18 is the Hebrew, the Hebrew word baldal. The, that word simply means to separate, sever, or put asunder. Okay? Light is created for that purpose. 
Now, it's important for us to keep it in mind because as we read through the Bible and as we look at God's Word, this is going to help you unlock so many great truths out of the Bible as you, as you study the Bible. So light, the purpose of light is to divide. Genesis chapter number 1, verse 18. Now also, look at verses number 3 through 5 in Genesis. Light also reveals, and this is very important, and it's very interesting to note this, each and every one of these points, the purpose of light is it's important for us because it reflects us as a Christian. Okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. Light reveals. Genesis chapter number 1, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Light reveals. Number one, Light reveals God's timetable. God's timetable. And this is a very interesting one concerning prophecy. When the wise men came to Bethlehem, what did they follow? The star. Exactly. What were the stars placed in heaven for? Light. To divide. Right? But here, it's very interesting that you see the word signs is mentioned. What did Jesus Christ say to the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites as, as they saw a sign from him? Jesus Christ said, you can, you can discern the weather, but you can't discern the signs of the times. Right? So, so that being said, these light in the heaven, the sun, the moon, And the stars that were created on the fourth day, they weren't created on the first day, okay? They were created on the fourth day. Don't misunderstand that. It never says in Genesis chapter number 1, 3 through 5, that that the sun was created on that day. It was not. The sun, sun, moon, stars were created on the fourth day, okay? And so it reveals God's timetable. How did the wise men know to go to Bethlehem? Because they knew the Bible, In Numbers chapter number 24, verse 17. Let's turn there really quickly in your Bibles. 17. The Bible says this, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Numbers Numbers 24, 17. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Here you see a prophecy of the Messiah, a star, a scepter, referring to Jesus Christ himself. It's for a sign. You can also mark in your Bible, Matthew chapter number 2, verse 2. That's where the wise men came to Herod. Um, you see the account as they, the wise men followed the star to Bethlehem. Also in Revelation chapter number 22, verse 16. Look at this passage of scripture really quickly with me. All the way in the back of your Bible. Revelation 22, verse 16. The Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Okay, stars, the light, the stars were also placed in the Bible to reveal God's timetable. And it's very interesting that the, that word signs is mentioned first out, first in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 14. Also, it is to reveal God's glory. It is to reveal God's glory. In, the, in this day of creation, lights were placed into the world to, not, to reveal to us the glory of God. Romans chapter number 1 declares this unto us, that the beauty of the creation itself is a witness against mankind for the own salvation of their own soul. They have no excuse. Okay? God's glorful creation, and God sent forth the sun, the moon, the stars, to reveal His beautiful creation to us, that there is a God. 
And so, here in the Bible, in Genesis chapter number 1, it's to reveal God's glory. And may I add a little side note here? You are to reveal God's glory in your life. If Christ has saved you, number one, you should be divided from the darkness of this world, and you should be revealing the hope of Jesus Christ in your life. That's not in my notes. That's free. Okay? That's for you. That's what you should be doing. And here, as we study this portion of light, it's revealing who we should be as Christians. Number one, or the third thing under the purpose of light, go back to Genesis 1.18. It's to rule. Very interesting. Verse 18, it says, And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. If you, if you turn to John chapter number 1, we're going to get there in a little bit. But in John chapter number 1, it's talking about the light of Jesus Christ and how darkness was not going to overtake it. Why? Because the light was created to rule. May I tell you something? That we as Christians, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ one day. Amen? But may I tell you, you know, I, I've heard of pastors saying, oh, you know, the church is going to get smaller in the last days and blah, blah. But can I tell you, light rules. And my, I forgot who said it, but the darker the night, the brighter the light. Okay? And God gave me a wonderful thought that I, I jotted down in, in the back of my Bible. The brightness of the church depends upon the fire in the, in the people. Okay? The brightness of the church that depends upon the fire in the people. So if you're going to be a bright and shining light for the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to get that fire going in your soul. Amen? That means you have to do what you know to do right. That means you have to get in God's word, you need to pray, you need to be faithful, you need to serve. If you're not doing those things, you're out of the will of God, plain and simple. And your job is to be a light. You are to glorify God. We are to make a division between what's right and what's wrong, the sinfulness of this world, and the holiness of God. And light always rules. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We, we are the winners. We're not going to be overcome by the world, flesh, and the devil. Why? Because light rules. Plain and simple. That's the purpose of light. Number two. Moving through this quickly. That's good. The personal light. This is why I want to show you. The personal light. The story of light itself is found in the personal light. If you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 9 2, we see a wonderful passage of Scripture of our Savior. The Bible says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Here we see a wonderful expression of our Savior. He is the light. And the light shined in the darkness to a lost and dying people. That's us. This is the whole world. Turn to Gen John chapter number 1, please. John chapter number 1. I love the book of John. John's a very fa Gospel according to John is a very fascinating book. It's probably one of my favorite Gospels. Not because of the simplicity of it. A lot of, a lot of preachers say the, the Gospel according to John is very simple. But when you actually dwell upon the Gospel according to John, it's very deep. It really is. So much is revealed in the book of John, and it's, it's mind-blowing. In John chapter number 1, we see, and it's interesting, because each, each gospel, it's showing Jesus in a different light, so to say. Um, I know I've said this, I'll say it again. Matthew shows Jesus Christ as the king, and that's why you have the kingly line starting off in the book of Matthew. And Mark, Jesus Christ is seen as the top of the sermon. You'll always see the word and in Mark because Jesus Christ is constantly on the go. That's how the book of Mark starts. 
If you notice that when you read the book of Mark, you'll see that little word, and. Jesus Christ is a servant, and he's always moving from one place to the next, helping this person, helping that person. In the, in the book of Luke, you see him and his humanity, the Son of Man. You'll see that word, the Son of Man, many times in that book. In John 4, it's a very precious book as well, because Jesus Christ is pictured as God, and we see his deity right off the get-go in the book of John. John chapter number 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's declaring Jesus Christ to be God on, in verse number 1. The Bible says in verse 2, The same in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 8, talking about John the Baptist. He was not that light, but bear witness of that light. That was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Here we see who the true light is. Isaiah 9-2 gave us a prophecy of a light that was going to be shining in darkness. Jesus Christ himself, the person of light. Jesus Christ as being God manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 16. He was manifested in the flesh. Why? To be a light to this lost and dying world. To let them know, and it's very interesting to note this as well, and, this, and I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but light is always in, in the connection with life. Light and life are always connected. Why? Because light brings life. For example, ladies, hopefully you got some flowers maybe at Valentine's Day. You place it in a nice vase, and you set it where? Next to a window, right? Right? You, you, won't, you don't want to put it in a closet, do you? No, you want to place it by a window. You ever notice your flowers that they actually bend toward the light? Why? Because it's giving it light, life. Okay? That's what we should be to this world. The world should be drawn to us, attracted to us, bending towards us. Amen? Why? Because light brings life. And here we see that Jesus Christ, in John chapter number 1, he is declaring not only that he is God manifested in the flesh, but that he is the true light that came into this world to light every man. And the darkness comprehended it. That word comprehended just simply means did not overtake it. It can't overtake it. Why? Because light is good, according to Genesis chapter number 1. Number two, the person of light. The person of light, Jesus Christ, he is the true life giver. The true life giver. In John chapter number 8, and it's interesting to note that this verse is found in John 8. John 8, verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Yes, the light of life. And so, Jesus Christ being the light of the world... If you follow him, you're going to have the light of life in your life. You're going to be a new creature. In the book of John, you see, you'll see the I am's of Jesus Christ. And here is one of them that we find in John 8. That Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And those that have been saved, those that have been brought out of darkness, Christ has given you life. And we are, and I'm going to get to it here in a little bit, but we are to radiate that light for the Savior. Turn over to John chapter number 12, verse 46. It says, but some of them... Oh, that's it, verse 11. Chapter 11. Verse 26 of John 12. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall, he also, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Oh, I read 26. I was supposed to read 46. Sorry. 
I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. This is the person, this is the purpose of Jesus Christ. That he is the life giver. He doesn't want you to abide in darkness. Why? Because, number one, darkness is not good, as we found in Genesis chapter number one. He wants you to abide in the light. Why? Because it represents life for your life, literally, spiritually. You want to you want a home in heaven one day? You want to spend eternity with Jesus Christ? You have to come to the light spiritually in your life. You have to come to him as he's drawing you because Jesus Christ should be an attraction for you even though he's revealing your sinful state and anyone that's saved in here today realizes that it wasn't a pleasant moment when Christ took the veil off your eyes and he showed you how sinful you really were in your life before you came to him. But that's the point of the Savior. He wants to give you life. He shows you that for the purpose so you can see the joy of having the light of life. Okay? John chapter 12, verse 46 shows us this. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 6, we see another passage of Scripture about the life giver, Jesus Christ. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. Such a wonderful verse. The light shined out of the darkness, and we see the love of God through the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? Why? Because he loved you enough to die for you. He was a light into this world. He is the life giver. Now, we saw the purpose of the light. We saw the person of light, and this is the one I'm going to park on for a little while. We're going to look at the people of light. That's us, if you're saved here today. Turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Most of us know this passage of Scripture, the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus makes a profound statement, and it's still profound unto this day. In verse number 13, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted. It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a Put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We, as God's people, are commanded, not suggested, to be the light of this world. Why? Because we have the light of God in us. If you don't know what I'm referring to, it's the Holy Spirit. We learned this in our discipleship class last night. The Holy Spirit, once you're saved, comes to, to abide in us. And because he abides in us, we have the Trinity living inside of us. Now, if you need some clarification on that, you can come talk to me after the service. I'll show you many scriptures out of the Bible that back up exactly what I'm saying. God lives in you. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory through the Holy Spirit. Amen. He comes to live in us. Now, if he's living in us, that means we have a glorious light abiding in us, correct? Correct. That means we are to be the people of light. And let me just put a side note in here. Do not think because you possibly in your mind can't do something for God that he can't use you. So many people step out of actually serving the Lord the way they should because in their mind, they try to play the role of Moses. Well, I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. May I tell you that there are two people, and two of these people you will know, Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody had a, a vocabulary of a fourth grader, if I'm correct. And God used him to turn this world upside down. The other person, Charles Spurgeon, he never even went to college. You might have not known that, but it seemed like he went to college, the Lord's College, amen. He was a very brilliant man. But can I tell you that just because in your mind's eye you don't think that you're someone, you, you're not eloquent, maybe you stutter, whatever it might be, 
do not think in your head that God can't use you. Only thing God is looking for is, are you available? Are you available for Him? Are you available to be used by Him? That's, only, that's the only thing that God wants. doesn't matter how much you know. doesn't matter how many years you went to college. I know where I went to Bible college. Um, the, the founder always looked down on people that got doctorates. And the reason for it is because the way he said it, when you get your doctorate, you become stupid. Okay? I'm not saying that... Doc, he, and he went on to say doctorates are not wrong, but you have to be very, very cautious because you start twisting and manipulating God's word um, to make it to where you want to say, and you think you're some person because you have a doctorate now. Um, and he was just emphasizing that because you have to be very, very careful when you get that degree. But anyway, he wasn't saying it was bad, don't get me wrong, but I'm just stating that. You don't have to be some kind of special for God to use you, okay? He'll use you where I'm at, where you're at. That's what I'm saying. So the people of light, number one, we are to be working. Turn to John chapter number 9, verse 4. The Bible says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As Christians, we are to be working for our Savior. We are to be laborers with our Savior. And 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, it declares how we should be laboring for the Lord. May I tell you, this is our job, this is our duty. Our, our, our compassion, our zeal, our, our steadfastness should be the same as Jesus Christ. We should be going forth, laboring for the Lord, even though we're weary, we're tired, and I praise God for 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Um, be steadfast, unmovable. We need to be steadfast and unmovable, working the works of the Lord and praying that God just brings the increase. People still can get saved. People can still be discipled. People can still have their homes flipped upside down, turned around to a 180 where everyone's going to look at it and see what happens. Can I tell you, we need to get into that harvest field and continue, continue laboring for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus here, he gives us his desire, his motive, his passion. I must work the works of him that sent me. Can I tell you that you are sent by Jesus Christ into this lost and dying world? While it is day, you know that there's coming a time the harvest season is going to be open, over. Jesus Christ is going to step out of the clouds and he's going to call every single one of us home according to 1 Thessalonians. And let me tell you, your opportunity to be a witness in this world is over. It's done. And what will you say that very moment when you see Jesus face to face? Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face. What can it be? When in rapture I behold him. Amen. What can you say to him? Oh, I was so busy with work. I was so busy doing this, that, and the other. No. You won't, I don't even believe we're going to have the opportunity to say that because we're, we're, I think we're just going to be silent unless we're, we're the people that were just sold out and did what we could for the Lord. Those are the people like Paul. I'm guilty of no man's blood on my hands. I preach Christ to everyone I came in contact with. I don't know, including myself, I don't know many people, anyone on this earth that can say that. I don't. Um, maybe there is, I don't know. But nonetheless, we are to be working the works of him that sent us. We are to be working. Number two, we are to be warring. Turn over to Romans chapter number one. Or chapter number 13, sorry. Romans 13, verse number 12. It says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. The armor is referring to the soldier. 
We are to be soldiers for our Lord. We're in the Lord's army. To put it simply, and what type of equipment are you wearing? Are you wearing the equipment of darkness, or are you wearing the equipment of light? That's what the, that's what the passage of Scripture is talking about. Am I, am I correct? So what type of weapons of our warfare are we warring with? See, we can't, we can't war in this world in our flesh with the weapons of our flesh. It says in 2 Corinthians, the, we, the weapons of our, our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to pulling down of strongholds. What are we using for weapons? Do we think we can conquer in our flesh? Do we think we can over, overcome and get the victory in our flesh by, the, by these worldly means? No, we cannot. It has to be putting on this armor of light. We are to cast out the works of darkness, and it's sad to say, and it's a rebuke to every single one of us in this room, that the Apostle Paul has to write this down, that as children of light, we need to cast off the works of darkness. It's such a rebuke um, to, to the Romans, and also to us, because all Scripture is profitable for knowledge, for, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It's a, it's a rebuke to us, because it's a shame that we're putting on an armor that does not belong on the children of God. It's such a shame. We are to put on the armor of light, not, on, not the armor of darkness. It's a shame that the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has to write this down because God knows the sinfulness of mankind even as a Christian. And he knows the battle that we go through. But praise God, we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And because of that, we can enter back into the fellowship of God that First John chapter number 1 is talking about. But may I tell you, we, are, we have a warfare, and we are warring. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. And if you haven't had any opposition lately, that's a good indicator that you're not in the war. Just a little side note. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them. Remember, light is to divide. It's, it's, there should be a separation. Jesus Christ said you cannot serve God and mammon. You, have to, you can't ride the fence. Pick which one you're going to serve. And I, can I tell you, it's a daily thing, because Jesus Christ said pick up your cross daily. And follow me. It's a daily thing. Okay? We are to reprove this work at wicked works of darkness. Have no fellowship with it. Lord, help us not to have any fellowship. It's not a relationship. It's talking fellowship. That means you're communing. You're having communion with whatever you're doing. You shouldn't have that type of fellowship with darkness. You shouldn't. I shouldn't. Why? Because we're in a war. And Satan's going to do anything he possibly can. I said this Wednesday night. I truly believe there is attack on God's men across this world. Um, whether it's my pastor back home or as pastor here, there is a great attack on er anyone and everyone that is trying to live for God. God's going to try to do anything he possibly can to hinder you, or not God, but the devil, going to do anything he possibly can to hinder you, destroy your testimony, destroy your effectiveness in this world. Because he hates you. Do you realize that? He hates you. And in Ephesians chapter number 5, we, or in Ephesians chapter number 6, we understand we need to put on the armor of God. Why? Because he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. And John 10.10 the thief coming not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy you. Do you realize this? That's why it's so important, so vital, that we prepare ourselves each and every day. Each and every day. Why? Because we're in a war. Number three, the people of life not only should be working, warring, but we are to be walking with our Lord. Ephesians 5, 8, just a few verses back up. For we... For ye were sometimes dark, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
And the fruit of the, all of this is for the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness and righteousness and truth. When we're walking with the Lord, these things will be found in you. Goodness and righteousness and truth as you're walking with the Lord, walking in this light. And that's where verse number 12 was sit. Verse number 10 is, 9 is stating. And so we are to be walking with our Savior. Turn over to 1 John chapter number 1, verse 7. The book of 1 John chapter number 1 is talking about our fellowship with the Lord. But it says here in verse 7, But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. We are to walk in the light of the Lord. Can I tell you that it's very, if you're neglecting this Bible that you have in your hands, can I tell you, you are not walking in the light? What do you mean, Brother Joe? Well, the Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if you're not in this book, if this book is not more important, to you, more important to you than anything in this world, can I tell you that you're not walking in the light of the Lord? And you will never have success. This book is very vital. My pastor back home, he sa he's said this, and as a very great thought. When he got saved, he spent, when he would get home from work, he spent hours upon hours upon hours every night in the Bible. In the Bible. He said he would read 20 chapters in a sitting. So much Bible. And this was his thought behind it. He said, for 21 years, I filled myself with this world. The only thing that can get the world out of me is the Word of God. You see... How much of the Bible are we putting into us every day? How much are we getting into our heart, soul, mind? Why? Because we are to be walking with the Lord. Last thing, we are to be witnessing. Touched on it a little earlier, but if you turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Book of Philippians. Verse number 14 through 16. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. So when we don't have our favorite ice cream tonight, let's not murmur and dispute about it. Amen? There's an ice cream party tonight for those that won the Super Soul Sunday, if you didn't know. Verse number 15, That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of light. Light and life. See how it's connected? Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We are to be witnessing for our Lord Jesus Christ, taking this precious book, the Bible, and giving it out to as many people as we possibly can telling them of the hope that lies within. And so, you don't have to turn here, but in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, or 4, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and our servants for your sake. Your, in your servants for Jesus' sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts to give light of the, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, this light that we're shining forth, it's the hope. In verse 4 it says, Whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel if we're not taking the light of the glorious gospel, what are we taking? What are we taking? We have to equip ourselves with a gospel light. Why? Because we are the people of light. Spurgeon said this, We are not to remove the darkness of ignorance, sin, and sorrow. Christ has lightened us that we may enlighten the world. It is, in, it is not ours to lie in concealment as to our religion. God intends his grace to be as conspicuous as a city built on the mountain's brow. To attempt to conceal his spirit 
is as foolish as to put a lamp under a bushel. The lamp should be seen by all that are in the house, and should be, and sh so should the Christian's graces. Household piety is the best piety. If our light is not seen in the house, depend upon it we have none. Candles are meant for parlors and bedrooms. Let us not cover up the light of grace. Indeed, we cannot be hid. If once the Lord has built us on the hill of his love, neither can we dwell in darkness if God has lighted us and set us on a candlestick. Lord, let me be zealous to spread abroad the light I have received from thee even throughout the whole world. We are to shine as people of light. Let's not hide our light this week. Why? Because we won't be overtaken. It might seem like it sometimes that the darkness of this world is going to overtake us, but we're not going to be overtaken. I showed you that from the Bible this morning. We are victorious. Christ is victorious. He's already, he's already won the victory, and we live in him. So let's take this glorious light of the gospel of Christ this week and give it. Why? Because this world needs it. Let's be like the sunlight that hits 80 meters down into the ocean. Let's, let's, shine, let's let us shine so bright here in this church that this world's going to see it. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, God, for this simple lesson on light. I know it's been an encouragement to me. I pray that it would be an encouragement to each and every person under the sound of my voice. I ask that you would be with the next service, that you'd greatly bless it. I pray that you would be with that one that is nearest hell and does not know you as their Lord and Savior. May they come to the light by the glorious gospel. Well, thank you so much for it. Be with Brother Josh as he preaches this morning. Give him liberty, clarity. Help him, Lord, to declare your word. We ask it in your heavenly name, Jesus. Amen. A couple minutes, the church is going to start. Feel free to get a drink, use the restroom, whatever you want. <laughs>